I want to look at a passage of scripture from Job chapter 23. Those of you with your Bibles, I just need to share a word with you from Job chapter 23. Um, and I solicit your prayers, please. I want to read from the King James Version. And I want to let you know, eight weeks, um, I'm confident I'm a bit rusty. And so get out the steel wool and help me this morning rub this message. Help me rub this sermon to get the sheen back on it uh, and get some of the rust off. And so if you pray, I'm sure God will extend the power to preach his word. Job 23, beginning with verse number 1. The sacred writing reads as follows. Then Job answered and said, Even today is my complaint bitter. My stroke is heavier than my groaning. Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come even to his seat. I would order my cause before him and fill my mouth with my arguments. I would know the words which he would answer me and understand what he would say unto me. Will he plead against me with his great power? No, but he would put strength in me. There the righteous might dispute him, so should I be delivered forever from my judge. Behold, I go forward, but he is not there. And backward, but I cannot perceive him. On the left hand where he doth work, but I cannot behold him. He hideth himself on the right hand that I cannot see him. But he knoweth the way that I take. And when he tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Those of you that stood for the reading of the word may be seated in the presence of the Lord. As I solicit again your prayers, please. Nine weeks ago, I preached a sermon titled, I'll Be Back. I was preparing to take some time to reconnect, to reevaluate, to retool, to re-energize the best I could in the presence of Almighty God. After 37 years of preaching ministry, after 30, more than 30 years of pastoral ministry, I just needed some time to catch my breath, and you were kind enough and generous enough to give me the time that I needed to go catch my breath. I did some traveling, visiting family and children. I did some golf, not as much, I guess, Deacon Roberts as I thought I would have. I did some catching up on much needed chores and I did a lot of praying and I did a lot of reading of God's word. I said to you um, those many weeks ago that I'll be back and today I say to you, I'm back. I'm back. Just want to talk to you a little bit and say I had some interesting revelations, some startling insights while um, I was away those eight weeks. First, I found out that how long really eight weeks is. <laughs> when you're off, it seems like it's forever, but I mean, when, it, when you're working, it seems like it's forever, but when you're off, it seems like it just flies right away. It was amazing, really, how fast um, those weeks went and that time went by. It seems like I just started and I looked around and I told my wife, look, I got one week to go. I thought about the things I did. I thought about the things I didn't do, the things that I wanted to do and the things that I should have done. But time caught up to me and I had to return with so much that was left undone. What's done is done, and what I discovered is that you can't get back yesterday. That you can't get back the time that you've already spent. You can't get back the day that you've already had. I'm back, but I discovered there are no do-overs for yesterday. 
that what happened in the past is in the past and what happened yesterday is, in, is yesterday. You get to pick up yourself today and start all over saying the words of that old hymn, one day at a time, sweet Jesus. That's all that I'm asking of you. This time off just seemed like really an extended weekend. But I will say that God put some things on my heart that I'm still in the planning stages of. There are some life altercations and life transformation moments that I'm still working through. And I've discovered that I can't let time get away from me. I've discovered that I can't waste time. So that I encourage you too to enjoy every moment that you get. Because soon you too will look back and wonder where did your eight weeks go? You'll look back and wonder where did your eight months go? You'll look back and wonder where did your life go? Yeah, I got a marvelous revelation in terms of that rest and growth and development as it relates to it. I got a revelation in terms of rest and how rest provides growth and gives you growth physically, but it also gives you growth spiritually, mentally, and emotionally. I'm back. And I discovered more than ever in my rest that rest and growth go together. You ever wonder why newborns sleep 20 hours a day? You ever, ever wonder why babies sleep 12 hours a day and teenagers sleep all day? <laughs> it's because they're growing so fast and so rapidly that rest and growth go together. If you want to grow, your body has to rest. I watched my granddaughter and got a good lesson for her how she sleeps for hours upon hours. And the reason she is sleeping so much is because she's growing so fast. I discovered in my time off that my greatest growth comes in my greatest rest. I just want to talk to you. If you want to grow, you got to rest. You got to pull away from the hustle and bustle from time to time. You got to pull away from all the busyness and every now and then put it in park and just wait on God. If you want to heal, you've got to rest. If you want to grow, you've got to rest. If you want to thrive, you've got to rest. If you want to succeed, you've got to rest. That's one reason we don't grow is because we've always got something going on. We wonder why we're still where we were a year ago, two years ago, ten years ago. It's because we're always doing. We are always busy. Well, I want to ask you to take a lesson from a granddaughter and find a spot on the couch. Get your blankie. Pull your family around you. Uh, it's her stuffed bears, her stuffed dogs, and her stuffed monkeys, and rest. In the rest, you will grow, and the things you were wrestling with in your rest, God will reveal to you the answers. I'm back. But in that rest, I had to do some hard things. I had to do some hard self-examination. I had to look at the man in the mirror and ask myself, who is he? I had to ask myself, what is he doing? I had to ask myself, where is he going? It's amazing, Deacon Darby, that self-inspection is the hardest inspection to do. It's easy to look at other people's lives and determine where they're coming up short and where they're failing and what they need to get together and how they need to sharpen and where they need to sharpen and where they need to put it back together. But to look at your own life and to do that critical analysis is a difficult proposition. I looked at myself, not anybody else, and asked myself some hard questions. Hopefully, with the hard questions, I will get some of the answers. I'm back. But one of the things with the hard questions is that I didn't get any answers. And I really thought during this time, I really thought during the eight weeks, I really thought during my time off that God was going to give me the answers I was looking for with lightning bolts and with thunder and earthquakes and tremors. But it didn't happen that way. 
the reality is and the truth of the matter is, is that I searched for God. I asked for God to speak to me. And what I got was something I never expected. What God really did was hide. I looked for him in every trip. I waited for him around every corner, but could not find him. I searched for him every day, but as unusual as it sounds, he was nowhere around. He was silent. He was nowhere to be found. I would wake up in the morning and go to bed at night looking for him, waiting for him, waiting to hear what he had to say to me. I kept my ear heavenward saying, God, speak to me. For your servant hears. I look for him on my right hand. And on the left. I look for him above. And I look for him beneath. And I couldn't find him. I had a Job moment. For eight weeks I searched for him. But Deacon Roberts I couldn't find him. For eight weeks I listened for him, but I couldn't hear from him. I looked for God everywhere I went and couldn't find him. I looked for him on the right and on the left, and he was not there. I looked for him in front of me and behind me, and he wasn't there. I know that's not what you wanted to hear, but it wasn't what I wanted to experience either because I wanted God to pull up a seat beside me in the living room. I wanted him uh, to pull up a seat behind me, beside me in the car while I was driving, and I wanted to hear him speak something with clarity and profundity I wanted to hear him say something to me that would change my world alter my life and transform my spirit I searched all over went to the highest mountain searched all over and even went through the lowest valleys and I couldn't find him he wasn't there and he knew I was looking for him he knew I was coming for him he knew I wanted to talk to him he knew I was after a God encounter he knew I needed a God moment but I couldn't find all he said to me in my search for him after eight weeks was, can you trust me when you can't find me? All he said to me after the eight weeks is, can you be faithful when you can't hear me? Can you love me when you can't feel me? And don't think I'm strange. Because if some of you were honest up in here, you'd have to say too that on many occasions you've looked for God in all of your troubles. You've looked for God in all of your weariness. You've looked for God in all of your fatigue. You searched him. You cried at night. You bent your knee all night long. And you discovered that in your search for him in all of the pressures of your life, in all of the turmoil of your experience, you looked for him, but you couldn't find him either. Mm, you had to holler out, God, where are you? God, where are you? God, speak to me. I need to hear your voice. In fact, yesterday our whole city was saying after 11 people died and six injured in a horrific shooting in Squirrel Hill, the whole city was saying, God, where are you? I'm back, but I still have to ask God, where are you? I asked the question, then I heard Job calling out to me saying, I looked for him. He was not on my right nor my left. He was not in front of me or behind me. 
Yet he knows the way that I take. For when he uh, has tried me, he said, I shall come forth as gold. After I go through everything I've go through, after I've been through everything I've been through, I know God is up to something and that God has something in mind that I shall come forth as pure gold. For Job sought God too and could not find him. You remember him, don't you? Job, the suffering servant of God. Job, the man that Satan appealed to uh, God uh, to attack. Job, the man that had been perfect and upright in the sight of God. Job, the man who was blessed with seven children, a wife, cattle, lands, houses, and servants. Job, uh, the man who suffered ailment and disease and skin worms and boils all over his body. Job, the man who sought consolation with his friends but got none. That Job, you know him, went searching for God, saying, God, I need to speak to you. Nobody else is going to do me any good. Trump certainly can't help me uh, with his crazy self. I can't find help in him. Uh, I can't find uh, in Governor Wolf. I can't find help uh, with Mayor Perduto. Uh, listen, Fitzgerald can't help me. God, I need you. Nobody but you can help me with what I'm going through. I need you, God, to speak to me. I need to find you, God. And sometimes in our lives we too look for God and he is nowhere to be found and I'm talking about when we are under attack and our world is crumbling and all hell is breaking loose and life is falling apart we go looking for God and can't find him it's a perplexing situation it tries your spirit it messes with your mind it wrinkles your soul it troubles your spirit and you wonder if I can't turn to God then where can I turn. If he won't come to me when I need him, then when will he come? Well, let me just say real quick and offer a few points and I'm out of your way, but let me just say I'm back. But I've learned in my time away, Deacon Darby, that the more effective you are, the more attacks you'll encounter. Oh, I wish I had a praying church right about now because you need to understand that the more effective you are, uh, the more attacks you will encounter. Satan is not going to attack ineffective folk. Did you hear me? Satan is not going to go after folk who aren't doing anything, folk who are doing nothing and ain't about nothing and ain't going nowhere and who are not on the battlefield, who are at ease in their walk. He's not going to attack lazy Christians and indifferent churchgoers and meaningless people. He's not worried about folk that talk it but can't walk it who are not striving to be better today than they were yesterday. But the attacks come for those who are about it. Attacks come for those who are on the battlefield. The attack comes for those who are on the mission, who are living the life, who are on assignment or from God, who are holding up the bloodstained banner of the Lord. That's who Satan wants. The more effective, the stronger the attack will be in your life. I'm back. But I know now that God has something great in store for me and for Central because of the size and the severity of the attack. I ain't going through it for nothing. But I believe at the end of the something that I'm going through uh, that God has something great on the other side. I believe Central, we ain't going through it for nothing. Uh, but God's got something great in store. And in mine. Job was under attack, Deacon Darby. So he appealed to his friends for advice and wise counsel. And the best his friends could say was, well, um, Job, listen, we're sad to say, but um, you must have done listen you must have done something wrong I, I don't need friends like that I'm just here to tell you I don't need friends like that uh, who kick me when I'm down I, I don't need friends who accuse me without evidence uh, I don't need friends who slander me instead of support me uh, but I need friends that when I come to them uh, they'll stand in the gap they'll intercede uh, they'll go to God on my behalf they'll walk through the pain with me they'll enter the affliction on my behalf uh, what I can't handle they 
say, give it to me and I'll be able to handle it for you. If you got friends that are just going along for the ride, you need to kick them to the curb. If they only are there when you got something, you need to let them go. But somewhere along the line, you need to grab some friends and say, listen, will you walk through me with the difficulty? Will you go with me when all I got is a bus pass and not my car? Will you be with me when I don't have a dime in my pocket? Will you stand with me? When my world is falling apart, you got to please remember Job had done nothing wrong. And I just need to let somebody know as I've discovered that sometimes the storms come because not you did like you did something wrong, but the storms often come because you do something right. Is there an amen anywhere in here? That sometimes your trouble comes not because you did something wrong. But sometimes your trouble comes because you're doing it right. Quit believing your accusers. You start saying like them, I must have done something for all this to take place in my life. You start sounding like them, I must have done something wrong. You keep saying, why me, Lord? And listen, the best theological, biblical, and spiritual response that I have to that is, why not you? Do you not know, listen, do you not know that God is looking for somebody to be an example? That God is just searching high and low, looking for somebody that he can tell Satan, look, uh, you can do whatever you got to do but uh, um, listen don't touch their soul and I promise you they'll always praise me I promise you that never deny me I promise you God God wants all God wants uh, is, an, uh, is somebody to be an example for him someone who can be an example of how to trust in trials somebody uh, to be an example to how to persevere through the pain somebody to be an example of how to keep the faith in the fall somebody to be an example uh, to how to live in the midst of death somebody to be an example on how to reach when your life is a wreck. Somebody that can be an example to the almighty. And how to live through the pain and the pressures. All right, so here it is, here it is, here it is. Because what I'm suggesting to you and what I experience is this, um, that no matter how much pain, trouble, or uh, how much hardship that you experience, here's what you need to know to make it through. Here's what you need to encounter. Here's what you need to have in your spirit. And that is that there is purpose in the pain. <laughs> I'm just about where I need to be. That there is purpose in the pain. I know you're going through it. I know the enemy has been relentless in your life and in mine. I know Satan has been busy. I know you've been used and abused, but just know what I've discovered, that there is purpose in the pain. What I'm trying to suggest to you is that you ain't going through it for nothing, but there is meaning in your misery. There is reason in your wrestling. Uh, know that when you are placed in the crucible of life and crushed to powder, uh, that God has something in mind. There is a purpose for it all. You may not understand it now, but God will have it all work together for your good. No matter how bad it appears right now, no matter how miserable your experience is right now, if you just trust God and believe in him, uh, if you lean not unto your own understanding, I need you to know that God will work all of that out. All the pain, all the hardship, all the misery you're experiencing. God has a way of weaving it together for a divine tap tapestry to do something marvelous in your life. Do you know what the grit factor is? Do you know what the grit factor is? Do you know um, what the grit factor is? Um, Lisa Bevere defined it as courage and resolve or strength of character. Others call it uh, the never say quit attitude. It is the one factor that will determine the future success of a person, the grit factor. It is the grit factor that will determine your success as a person that resolve never to quit, never to give in, never to give out. You got to have that perseverance factor that no matter what happens in your life, you got to have a no quit uh, kind of attitude. And it is that no quit attitude that is the determination 
determining factor of your future success as a person. Um, grit ranks above talent. Uh, the grit factor ranks above your capability. Grit factor ranks above how many degrees you got. A uh, grit factor ranks above how much money is in your pocket. The grit factor ranks above how large is your network. Uh, your grit factor ranks above your capability. It ranks above your charisma. Um, and she describes it as the secret ingredient that will allow us to see our dreams turn into realities. It is also the godly trait that allows us to see the fulfillment of God's promises in our lives. It is an ever-present element of irritation that God just might be using to create something new and priceless and beautiful in your life because all the stuff that's getting on your last nerve, everything that you're going through um, that really is irritating your life, I need you to know God is using it to use it to recreate you and to make something beautiful out of your life. Every irritation, everything that is bothering you, everything that's getting on your nerves, God is using that grit to grind you and to get you to a place where he can create a new creation in your life. And the problem is that we too often run from the very process that would lead us to the fulfillment of the promise. We go through all of the trouble and misery and we see it and we run from it. But it's the very thing that God is going to use to fulfill the promise that he has in store for your life. God is working something marvelous out in your life, but he needs to grind you. He needs to see how much grit you got. And when you got the no quit attitude, you may not have been able to make it by yourself, but God will partner with you and he'll stand in the battle with you. He'll give you courage to fight on. He'll give you the strength to keep moving. He'll be a very present help in the time of trouble. Hang on, my time is almost up, but maybe you'll understand it if I say it the way Richard Rohr said it. He said the path of descent is the path of transformation. That when you're seeming like you're going down, you need to know that that's when your greatest transformation uh, is about to take place. And darkness and failure and relapse and death and woundedness are our primary teachers in the process. Um, that if we're ever going to get to where God would ultimately have us to be, it's going to be through the pain and the affliction and the crucible of life uh, that tries to crush us in order to create us. The problem with dealing with our pain is that... If we do not transform our pain, we will most assuredly transmit it. That if the pain that you're going through right now doesn't transform you into something that you could never become without it, then what ultimately you do is you transmit that pain that you will not let transform your life you will transmit it to somebody else. And you know who we usually transmit it to? The people that are the closest to us. We transfer it and transmit all of the pain that we won't allow to transform us into a new creation that God has in mind. Um, we use uh, uh, that pain to transmit it onto somebody else that is closest to us, like our spouse or our wife, our husband, our children, our closest friends. Uh, we use it and we transmit it upon them. But I've never seen a birth yet. It didn't start without some pain. Ask any woman in here who has been through uh, childbirth and they'll tell you, uh, regardless of the epidural, regardless of what drugs you receive, the Demerol or whatever else, uh, uh, here's what you'll understand. Uh, um, that they knew it was birthing time because uh, of the pains that they experienced. They knew um, that it was time to give birth because uh, of the labor pains, the contractions that were coming in the womb. And I need you to know the closer the pains got, uh, the closer 
uh, the birthing was. And somebody here today, your pains are kind of close. I don't know if they're five minutes apart or three minutes apart, but I need you to know you're real close to birthing something in your life. Oh, you're real close. To birthing, somebody say I'm real close. Somebody say I'm real close. I'm real close to birthing something in my life. Uh, um, I haven't preached in eight weeks, and so, so let me just touch the text for a half a second, because you got to remember Job suffered, right? And he suffered not just a little bit, Deacon Roberts, but he suffered mm -hmm, a whole lot. When trouble came to visit him, it didn't just come by his house and said, um, I'm going to drop something in your mailbox and I'm going to move on. No, trouble pulled in the driveway, had a U-Haul, uh-huh, had a U-Haul, started pulling out boxes, suitcases, duffel bags, backpacks, uh, uh, didn't knock on the door, just kicked uh, the door in and put the bags in the living room and said, I'm going to be here a while. You ever been there? You ever been there? Trouble just didn't come and go, but trouble decided it's going to stay at your address for a little while. Um, Job lost his cattle, lost his servants, lost his children. It his wife left him. His body was afflicted uh, uh, with disease. He was sick, had boils, skin worms, and everything else. And on top of that, all of that, he had some trifling friends that began to create suspicion and accusation and said, Job, come on, tell us the truth. You must have done something wrong for all this trouble that you are going through. I wish I was a better preacher. Watch this. I wish I was a better preacher, but let me just, let me just, let me just, let me just ask you a quick question. Do you know why? Do you know why um, there, there are dimples on a golf ball? Do you know why there are dimples mm -hmm, on a golf ball? It was discovered that if you beat up the ball, it was discovered that if you beat up the ball, if you scar it uh, and scuff it, well, I'm talking about when the first golf balls were um, leather and they had feathers on the inside, um, it changed to wood, and then finally it went to another material and they decided um, it was discovered that if you scuff it up, if you scratch it up, if you scar it up, uh, um, the golf ball will uh, 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 go better. It'll fly farther. Um, it'll have more control. It'll, it'll, it'll have greater distance that will go with it. Uh, and, and do you not know that sometimes um, um, the reason God's got to scuff you up uh, and the reason sometimes gotta, God's got to scar you up and, and sometimes you got to go through the fires and through the furnaces and sometimes you got to be beat up today and beat up tomorrow and sometimes you got to take a a hit now and take a hit later um, it's because God is trying to get you to go further um, than you ever, if life is smooth uh, I'm telling you uncontrolled uh, if life is smooth uh, you don't go as far but it's when it's getting rough sometimes uh, and you have to get scarred up and beat up um, that's when your life goes a little better um, that's when your life goes a little farther um, that's when your life becomes a little more controllable um, that's when you got to get on your knees and say father I still stretch my hands to thee on no other help I know but if thou withdraw of thyself from me anybody been there is there a witness in the house that it's when you got beat up and knocked down and got back up on your feet that's when you can go the furthest that's uh, uh, watch the text because um, here's the shout point, watch. Because, because after all Job had been through and after all of his search for him and couldn't find him and after everything he experienced, um, um, Job says, but um, he, here's something that I can recall. He says, um, uh, but he mm -hmm, knows the way that I take. For when he has tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Um, here's the shout, here's the shout, Deacon Roberts, because when, 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 listen, listen, here's your shout too, because when, when I couldn't find God, the implication in the text is that I can't find him. But he knows the way that I take, that when I can't find him, he knows exactly where I am when I can't hear him he can still 
Oh, don't you realize that's my comfort, that's my hope, that's my strength, that when I don't know where he is, he knows exactly where I am. There's a little store in New Brighton called Fantastic. There's a little store in New Brighton called Fantastic. Um, it's a candy store. They got all the candy in the world. Any candy you want, they got it. I mean, they got it. They got it. Any candy you want, they got it. And when my children were little, I used to take them down to Fantastic, get all the candy they wanted. They get licorice. They get red hot. They get them sour lemon things that I couldn't stand, but I'd eat them anyway. Um, I, they had potato chips. They had everything. They had pretzels. They had Tootsie Rolls. They had Mary Janes. They had they had all kind of candy down there. And and one of the interesting things that that, that they did is that when my children um, uh, would go, I would take them. Uh, but when they got a little older, they wanted to go by themselves, and 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 I was a little uncomfortable with that. Um, and so um, it was kind of it was kind of a rite of passage to be able to go to Fantastic on your own. And we only lived about maybe five blocks from the little store, and and, and fifty cent could get you a whole little brown bag of candy. And so it was pretty cool. Um, but when they got they got of age, about maybe ten years old or so, um, they they would say, "Daddy, can I go to Fantastic?" But Daddy, I don't want you to go with me, and um, I just want to go down uh, to Fantastic by myself. And so, do you mind if I go? And I'd say, Oh Lord, well, uh, uh, and with a whole lot of hesitation and reservation, I'd say, Yeah, um, uh, go ahead down. And so they start down and walk down by themselves to Fantastic. Um, but little did they know that hiding behind the tree, um, looking for them going down the down the street, their daddy was hiding, and and they'd look back and wouldn't see the daddy, but I'd see them as they went down to get their candy to make their day and they go to the next block and I'd run from behind the tree and I'd hide behind the car and I'd be looking for them, watching them uh, wherever they went, they'd look back being so proud, thinking um, that they were going down the road on their own, but really I was hiding behind every tree I was hiding behind every car every garage I could find uh, I was keeping an eye on my child because I didn't want anything to happen to my child uh, and they and they would go down to Fun's Task to get their candy and come on back, be so proud of uh, I'm thinking that they had gone down there by themselves, uh, uh, but little did they know daddy was behind every tree. Daddy was behind every car. Daddy was behind every garage uh, watching over them. And all I'm trying to tell you uh, is I don't know where your fantastic is. Uh, and if you think that your daddy ain't watching, uh, you need to know when you look back and don't see him, uh, he's behind every problem. He's behind what you're going through my God my God my God is always there uh, I'm trying to finish I really am I'm trying to finish I really am I'm trying to finish I really am but there's a word in here that I gotta mess with just for a half a second because he says um, um, listen he says that um, uh, 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 he knows the way that I take. And watch this. He says, when he has tried me, I promise I ain't going to be much longer. When he has tried me, I shall come forth as gold. There's a word in there that just messes with me. And the word, the word is tried. It comes from the Hebrew word nasah. N-A-S-A-H. It comes from the Hebrew word nasah. Um, nasah really means not only tried, but it means to test. It means to prove. It's more than just saying I'm going through it, but um, it's going through it with purpose. It's, it, it, has a, it has a sense that um, it's, it's proving you, it's testing you, it's trying you, and, and it, has, it has the strong implication of a metallurgical overtone. So that, so that when metal is placed in fire, um, it is said that it is tried. Um, and it is tried because in metals there are impurities, especially in gold. If you want pure gold, you got to try, no, you're not hearing me. You got to try it in the fire. And when you try it in the fire, um, the silver and the gold loses its impurities or its draw 
dross uh, in the fire and when it comes through the fire it comes forth as pure gold and some of you are wondering right now uh, why your life is heated up you're wondering uh, uh, why you're in the fire well I need you to know uh, God is trying you he's getting the impurities out of your life uh, uh, so that ultimately you can be like Job uh, and come forth uh, as pure gold uh, and somebody in here you're saying well I don't like the process uh, I don't like what God is doing to me well I've learned something as I made my way back uh, I've learned something and the something that I've learned is that when God wants to drill a man and God wants to uh, thrill a man and skill a man when God wants to mold a man and uh, play the noblest part uh, when he yearns with all his heart uh, to create so great and bold a man uh, watch his methods uh, and watch his ways uh, how he ruthlessly perfects uh, who he royally elects uh, how he hammers him and hurts him and with mighty blows converts him into trial shapes of clay that only God understands how his tortured heart is crying and he lifts beseeching hands how he bends but never breaks when it's good he undertakes my God he knows what you're going through and whatever it is you can trust God that gold is coming at the end he's doing a precious thing in your life you may not see him you may not hear him but our God will bring you forth as pure gold my time is up but somebody today is wrestling somebody is wrestling like I am and was trying to figure out God where are you where are you I search for you and can't find you. The comfort in your life is not knowing where to find him, but in knowing he can find you right where you are. I'm back. 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 And all I say to you is, please, be patient with me. God is not through with me yet. But when he gets through with me, yeah, I shall come forth as pure gold. Come on, Deb, as we stand as we stand and the truth is God is not through with you yet either he's working on you too you're a work in process he's not finished with you all the heartache all the pain all the trouble you experience God is doing a great work in your life don't give up on him and by all means, don't give up on yourself. It ain't over yet. It ain't over yet. There's so much more that God has in store for you and you and you and you and you and you. And you. It ain't over yet. He's about to do a new thing in your life. Don't run from the process. Because that's what he's going to use to fulfill his promise in your life. The crucible of affliction ain't easy. The crucible of sorrow ain't easy. But it is worth it. You know, pearls come at a high price. They have to be ground for a long time. They have to endure a lot of pressure. I don't want to be a cultured pearl. I don't want to be some man-made pearl. I don't want to be, I don't want to be that kind of pearl. I want to be genuine. 
I want to be the pearl of high price. That's what I want to be. God is doing something amazing in your life. Don't give up on him. Don't give up on him. Somebody here today. Somebody here today. Needs to put your trust in God. Trust him even when you can't see him. Be faithful when you can't hear him. And love him when you can't feel him. And watch what he does with your life. He'll fight your battles. He'll fight your battles. Just trust him. Somebody today, will you come forward? Give Jesus your life. Put your trust in him. Surrender to the almighty. Say, God, I'm tired of going my way, trying to do my thing. But God, I yield to you now. Will you come? If you've never given your life to Jesus, now is your time. If you've never asked him to forgive you of your sins and open your heart and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, now is the time. Will you come? Maybe you've turned away from God. Maybe you're backslidden. Will you come? Maybe you don't have a church home. Will you come and let Central be your church family? Will you come and join us today? Will you come and connect with the Central family? Wherever you are, come now. For the Spirit says come. The bride says come. Whosoever will, let him come to the Lord. Praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Is there another will you come? Uh-huh. I will be with you. Uh-huh. Will you come? I will be with you. Yes, I will. If you only trust me. Will you come? Come on. Trust me. I want you to do something as we sing this song. Would you mind? Would you mind as many as you will, as many as you can? I want to do something today because our city is mourning. Our city is grieving. Too many times we think that tragedy strikes other states and other cities, but it never will strike here. Well, yesterday proved us different. The tragedy can strike anywhere and at any time. Even in your march to the synagogue, to the temple, to the church of God, to the house of God, tragedy can strike. It happened in our city. And I just want you to come to the altar today and intercede with me on behalf of all of the families of the victims, the 11 persons that lost their lives and died in such a horrific manner, for the six that are injured. Would you mind joining me at the altar today? If you just feel led, just come and stand at the altar. I will fight your battle. Mm -hmm. I'll fight your battle. Oh, yes, I will. Mm -hmm. I'll oh, fight your I will battle. fight your battle. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. If you, if you only trust me. Oh, Trust me. Mm. I'll fight your 
Yes. Oh, yes, I will. I will fight. I'll fight your battle. Oh, I'll fight your battle. battle. Oh, yes, I will. If you only trust me, only trust me, trust me, oh yes, sir, trust me. God, today in our pain and in the grief of our city and in the sorrow of Squirrel Hill, hey God. Yes. Well, thank you, we intercede on their behalf. Lord, we ask now in Jesus' name that your hand of comfort would be upon our city. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Lord, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And that God in our sorrow, Thank you, Lord. in our mourning and in our grief, somehow, God, you might elevate our minds to trust you. We understand, God, that trouble is the kind of world we live in. But we also understand, God, that many are the afflictions of the righteous. But God, you deliver us out of them all. You promised us, God, that you'd be a very present help in the time of trouble. Reveal yourself. To the mourning families. Reveal yourself as their comfort. Care for them now. Embrace them God. Love on them God as only you can. Let them know God even in the greatest tragedy. That you can transform it. Into the greatest treasure. Only you can do that, Master. We say, have mercy. We say, have mercy. We say, have mercy, God. Have mercy on our city. Have mercy on our country. Have mercy on our world. Heal the families now. That's our cry. Heal the families now. Heal the community. Heal the community, God. Heal the Jewish community. Don't let them use this as an opportunity to quit. But let them use it as fuel to come together. And unite, God, in your presence and in your name. We speak against anti-Semitism. We bind it in the name of Jesus. Have mercy, Lord. Have mercy, God. We trust you. We believe that you will fight our battles. Because we believe that what's going on in our country it's greater than Wolf. It's greater than Peduto. It's greater than Fitzgerald. It's greater than Trump. Only you, God, can make these crooked things straight. Only you, God, can make these rough places plain. Only you can bring these high places down. We give them to you now, God. Yes, we do. We place Squirrel Hill, the city of Pittsburgh, yes, sir. our nation in your hands. And say, Lord, let your will be done. Have mercy on us, we pray. Let your grace abound. In the matchless and marvelous name of Jesus, we pray. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Come on, say amen again. Praise the name of Jesus. You return to your seat. 
You can return to your seats. You can return to your seats.